a special episode of my online history series. Um, you can watch my regular videos on medieval history at unauthorized.tv. Um, but today we're going to be talking about American history. And today I'm joined by Mary Gravar, um, who is the author of Debunking Howard Zinn, Exposing the Fake History that Turned a Generation Against America. Um, it's just out this summer from Regnery Publications, and I'm very grateful to have you with me, Mary. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. <laughs> so um, you actually hold a PhD in English um, from the University of Georgia, and you taught for a good 20 years at the college level until um, 2013, is that right? And, and um, you're now um, with the Alexander Hamilton Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. This is at Hamilton College, is that right? Um, well, uh, yeah, to go back, um, yeah, I taught for a total of about 20 years, including my <laughs> graduate teaching assistantships. And um, the last place I taught was at Emory. And I was teaching under a program called the Program in American Democracy and Citizenship. And that ended in 2013. And then in 2014, I moved up to here to Clinton, New York. Uh, I had had some contact with the Alexander Hamilton Institute, but it is not on campus. Uh, it was going to be on campus, and uh, we, or actually the three founders had some run-ins from the radical leftists in the faculty who wanted to take over uh, this institute, which was being funded by an alum. And so they decided to become independent. So we're housed in a nice old 1832 mansion on the Village Square in Clinton, a couple miles from the campus just down the hill. So we have a place, I have a place to live here and an office, and there's one other resident fellow as well. And we have reading groups for students. Uh, we have student internships. We do classes and events for the community here. So we're we're right on the village square. Okay, so that's excellent. So you're you've you've been in academia and you're familiar with the nuts, the insanity <laughs> that, yeah. that we've all been, <laughs> been experiencing. But but now you're you're sort of in this this priv I mean privileged, I think is a good word. <laughs> Um, position to be able to observe, but but comment on. And and I, I I told you when we first got in touch that I actually was familiar with your work from American Greatness. Um, you've mm -hmm. you've also written for quite a number of other um, publications, Minding the Campus, American Thinker, The Federalist, Front Page Magazine. So I I, I see you as an informed witness to uh -huh. all of this um, nonsense that we've been dealing with. And so I'm I'm really really grateful to be having this discussion with you and for you to help me as a medievalist understand what what's gone on right what's 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 gone wrong and i was i i mean i, I say i come to your book as a medievalist and there's a little bit of overlap to my own teaching that i actually teach a course on medieval travelers which ends with columbus and and you start and you're um, debunking Howard's in with Columbus, which is, I, I assume, where, where he starts too, right? So that we're we're dealing with a, a little bit of the transition problem. Um, how bad is it in American education now? You go through a, a good number of examples of how much Howard Zinn's book is is being used. Could you could you unpack a little bit of that for us? I mean, I I tweeted a little bit about you know how what a problem we have now in you know, American society, that the the reason that we are in the fights that we are culturally, your suggestion seems to be is that everybody's been reading Zen, or it's we've been reading more <laughs> Zen than we think we have. And someone tweeted back at me, as Twitter does, right? It's like, nobody's ever heard of Zen. But uh -huh. I, I, I got a rather different impression from your book. Yeah, have, well, have we heard of him. <laughs> A lot of people have. Uh, often it's because their kids were exposed to him in high school or even college, and they pick up the book and they're outraged because they know a little bit about American history. But I came across Howard Zinn when I was um, I was teaching. I had a number of adjuncts 
positions in Georgia when I was living there, you know, my dissertation just was not acceptable to the hiring committees. But um, so what I noticed, uh, you know, through graduate school, like in the 1990s, mostly, I, I kind of wove my way around radical professors, uh, took classes from those who had not yet retired to sort of the old guard. And I noticed the corruption of education in, in uh, English departments, deconstruction, uh, new historicism, all these theories that are derived from Marxism. And I started writing about education and came across Howard Zinn and wrote an article about him in 2008 or 2009. And then I was asked to write a report on him and present it at the National Press Club, which I did in 2010. And, um, and I, I, I had a... So, I almost had a book contract in 2011, but that fell through because of uh, the the editor at that publishing company. And then I came to the Alexander Hamilton Institute and was contacted again in 2017. I uh, was led to my agent and then to Ragnary Publishing. And uh, Howard Zinn is widely known. His book has a People's History of the United States has broken all publishing records for a book of its kind. It's the publisher's dream because it's used not only as a trade book, uh, you know, people aren't just buying it to read, uh, but it's also used as a textbook and it has sold well over 2.6 million copies. It sells more each year than it did the year before. And so it is the most widely used and the most popular American history book out there. And so it, it has also come into classrooms uh, through its use, especially now after the Obama administration changed the guidelines for AP US history. They've become very left wing. And so now a lot of teachers are openly using Zinn's book uh, because it prepares the students quite well for the advanced placement history exam uh, so they can get credit for that course. It used to be that teachers would often just sneak it in or, or photocopy pages, but now they're using it more and more openly. There's also the Zinn Education Project, which was started by one of Zinn's Boston University students from the 1970s, uh, who admired Howard Zinn, yet went on to earn his fortune in the capitalistic, evil American system and used that for fortune to co-found the Zinn Education Project. And to date, there have been over 90,000 teachers who have signed up for the lessons that use chapters and parts of Zinn's book, expand them into lessons, have suggested activities and assignments for teachers. And so these are downloaded and used in the classroom so students can get Zinn in that way. There's a young people's history of the United States, which is really awful, uh, but I learned that the eighth grade uh, classes in Portland, Oregon are all using that book. It's horrible, mm -hmm. uh, but, but it's, it's everywhere. There are teacher workshops. I went to a teach-in in 2012, uh, which was attended it was at Georgia State University, sponsored by the dean, the College of Education, attended by public school teachers, education majors, college students, their professors who had brought them. And here they were talking about adapting Howard Zinn down to the kindergarten level. And what oh should goodness. we, <laughs> yeah, what should we really tell 
uh, these five-year-olds about Thanksgiving? Should we tell them the truth? Should we tell them the truth about Columbus? <laughs> so, and of course, there's a popular culture, uh, The Sopranos, Goodwill Hunting, that uh, award-winning movie in, of 1997, rock bands praise him, Hollywood actors and actresses read from his book, uh, <laughs> you know, Bruce... Yeah, so that that i i was i was taken with that your example from goodwill hunting it's right it's like it's 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 seeped into our common cultural conversation in ways that you're not even aware of until you you were pointing them out in your book yes yeah yes Yes. so I, i i i'm gonna pull you back to your beginnings a little bit because i'm interested that in fact you were trained in in effect, rhetorical theory, right? That you you were mm-hmm. trained in English and you were trained in reading text and paying attention to the way texts are making arguments in a way that, I mean, I in 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 history in in medieval history, I've been very conscious that conscious of this um, throughout my own career, which I I think parallels yours and in, in time frame fairly well. That I was in graduate school in the late eighties, early nineties, and so what you were talking about. All the English professors being, you know, taken with the linguistic turn and and um, mm-hmm. deconstruction and rhetorical theory, and I'm I'm interested from from your own perspective, how that you you narrated it as you know people you were giving you were giving presentations on Zen and people asked you to do the 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 um, book, but I, I'm curious about how you yourself got drawn into reading his book. I mean, you you give us in the in. In your various chapters, you talk about a number of particular incidents that he warps in his in his version. We have Columbus, um, the encounter with the Native Americans or the Indians, um, the Civil War, um, the internment of the Japanese in World War II, the Cold uh, the Cold War, the Civil Rights Movement or the Black Power Movement, and the Vietnam War. Um, but I'm assuming is that is that the the, the whole of his his narrative or is that the, the things that you've highlighted as, as particular moments? I, I've had to highlight them. If I went through every single page of his book, I would have had, you know, multi-volume critique. Right. Okay. So, <laughs> I, I, can you tell us a bit about what, what it was, what was it like for you as someone who was trained in reading texts to work through his text? Because you've, you've worked through it in your, and debunking Howard Zinn as a, as a as a historian, right, showing the way in which he's distorting the facts that we have from the primary sources, the the way he's drawing on other historians. But I, I'm curious what you thought of it as a work of literature. Well, uh, one of the courses I took as a graduate student was classical rhetoric, and so we learned about the sophists. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that helped prepare me. And when I was teaching freshman composition at Emory, I always started with Aristotle's rhetoric and the three different appeals, logos, ethos, and pathos, um, mm. you know, the appeal t- to reason uh, and t- to emotion and to character. Uh, well, and I've also you know, looked at pieces of propaganda. I remember back when I was at the University of Georgia, we had this textbook that included uh, passages from Mein Kampf. <laughs> and, I rem- and I would also teach, uh, you know, some of the speeches of Mao Zedong. Mm-hmm. And I would try to uh, tell students about, uh, you know, what is legitimate rhetoric? What's using these tricks? how to distinguish between them. Uh, sometimes students, you know, if they'd see Mein Kampf, they think, well, it's in a book. And so it mu- this guy must be a good guy. I mean, that's how ignorant they were of history. Uh, and the same thing with Mao Zedong. They'd, uh, you know, look something up on the internet, you know, <laughs> a site from China. And it was like, <laughs> this guy is really great. So And I also, when I was teaching literature, I remember I was teaching an American literature survey course, and I was teaching a short story by Richard Wright. And I told the class, now this is from Richard Wright's communist period, when he was a member of the, you know, when he was involved with the communists. And I looked up 
and there were uh, about seven students who had completely befuddled expressions on their faces. And finally, one asked and said, uh, what is communism? They oh, my goodness. No, this is true. This is really true. Uh, this was at a state college, uh, Clayton State College, as it was then. Now it's a university. <laughs> uh, and, and you know, here, I mean, these were people who had high school diplomas. They'd never heard of communism. My students at Emory asso associated it automatically with a red scare. Um, but here you didn't know you have people who just have never heard of the word communism. And so how do you begin to explain that the short story is really propaganda or right? Uh, right? It's to convert people over to communism. It uses these emotional appeals. All the good guys are communists. All the evil people are uh, capitalists or members of law enforcement. Uh, and so, you know, where do you begin, even if you're teaching literature or if you're teaching rhetorical strategies, if you don't understand this? But getting back to Howard Zinn, <laughs> uh, he, he uses these strategies. Um, you know, he, he plagiarizes from an unreliable source. I've pointed that out in side-by-side -side passages in the book, uh, but he leaves out essential information. So the reader gets the opposite impression of what the original source intended. And he also uses these emotional appeals. He kind of, you know, in his first chapter, he changes the typical order of a history book. Most history books, well, you're the historian, right? You, um, you start off with an introduction, you lay things out, you describe your approach, and then you begin in chapter one. Well, Howard Zinn, it begins with this false presentation of Christopher Columbus and his men meeting these gentle Arawak Indians. And they are so consumed with their lust for gold that they enslave these Indians. They hack off their hands, uh, set dogs on them when they can't produce the gold that they want. And then Zinn uh, shifts course. He goes into this rant, this uh, emotionally outraged uh, diatribe and says, how could this happen? Historians in the past, uh, like Samuel Eliot Morrison, admit this happened, but they skim over it and talk about uh, Christopher Columbus as this great man. How could they do this? And here he is presenting himself as the ethical historian who is exposing this truth for the very first time. And he is just outraged over this immense suffering. And then he goes into, uh, you know, Montezuma and the Incas. And then he says, well, this is all a pattern. This, and then he goes into North America and the Indians there, and it's one outrage after another against a uh, uniformly peaceful, generous Indians. And so what he does is he hooks the reader emotionally, you know, first by presenting the false history, then, um, you know, expressing his own outrage uh, using leading questions, yes and no answers, uh, which uh, someone else has pointed out is very unusual in writing history. And then, you know, by the time you're at the end of the first chapter, if you are impressionable, if you're a high school student, a teenager, or don't know much about American history, uh, you might, you know, just sort of become wrapped up in the story uh, very emotionally. Well, so I, I, I find myself in kind of funny ways wanting to play devil's advocate here. <laughs> Why shouldn't we? No, it's like because I, I 
I've come under a lot of stress in the last few years for saying outrageous things in, in academia, like three cheers for Western civilization. So, you know, there you go. I, but <laughs> I, what, what, one of the things that I have done in my own writing, which I found many of my colleagues were frustrated by is curiously enough, exactly the thing Zen seems to be doing um, is, you know, the, the exercise of drawing the reader into the story. Right. And yeah. um, I've used it. I, well, I've used it in a number of ways, so, you know, in my own work saying, imagine yourself into this prayer practice or imagine yourself into this scene. And I'm, he's trying to generate, you know, feelings of outrage and I'm trying to give you a insight into a devotional experience. Um, and it, what I find, of course, amusing is many colleagues that I've talked to about Zen's, Zen's work are sympathetic to him <laughs> and, uh -huh. and antipathetic to me. And you could say, well, it's, you know, is it with whom we are trying to create sympathy? I mean, he has created a great deal of sympathy among, you know, even ordinary academics, as you as you point out, many people use his book in their teaching. Many people are drawn to his 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 website and, and his teaching programs precisely because they want to take the side of the people that he is feeling outraged on behalf. Um, so is it are we are are you and I as, you know, uh, critics of his work more upset by his his method or more upset by his target? Uh, well, I, I would say I'm upset by his method. Uh, certainly, uh, okay. you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not denying that, uh, you know, the, the Indians were treated unfairly. I mean, there were, there was blame to go around on both sides, but he boils it down to a black and white perspective. And he does it by lying about the history and, uh, you know, presenting Indians as childlike, uh, completely innocent, you know, really less than human, if, if you look at it that way. And, uh, and in order to just categorically uh, condemn the United States and then say it has absolutely no right to exist, which is what he does. And when right. you talk, right, uh, there is a history of, uh, you know, of the United States or the you know, people's history or a history of the American people that should be written, uh, some that have been written. But the thing that Howard Zinn does, he doesn't talk about um, the real heroes. Uh, one, for example, during the civil rights movement that I mentioned is E.D. Nixon, uh, who was a Pullman porter in Alabama, a leader of the local NAACP chapter in the 1950s, when it was very dangerous to do that. Uh, he was a brave man. He had a lot. He had successes, especially considering uh, what Alabama was like generally in the 1950s. He 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 um, uh, got the USL uh, to also uh, do something for black soldiers. He eliminated the special window for buying tickets at the train station that was there uh, for uh, African-Americans that was humiliating. He had these small victories and he was the mastermind of the Montgomery bus boycott. He does not appear in the first edition of Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. Uh, apparently so Zinn is lying even about the people that he says to champion, which I would agree with you is that that to me is the thing that is most frustrating, that if you want yes. to have a history of the United States and show the way in which all of the different groups have participated in creating the country that we have, and you claim to be championing one group and then don't even recognize its own heroes, you're lying. Exactly. And so the heroes uh, to Howard Zinn are those who were duped by the communists. So uh, he 
he loves it when, uh, you know, there is blood flowing in the streets or, uh, you know, the black radicals are encouraging rioting, which, by the way, in the 1960s uh, affected black neighborhoods. It destroyed them. It killed people. I mean, this is what Howard Zinn is championing. And he claims that nobody else cared about uh, you know, blacks in the 50s and the 60s besides the communists, which is a, a lie. I mean, all the surveys show that most black Americans uh, hated the radicals. They did not like communism uh, throughout the entire 20th century. Uh, they wanted reforms, but they did not approve of the groups that Zinn was promoting or the violent uh, revolutionary methods that he was promoting. So he really, uh, it's really a slap in the face of the American people. Yes. And that, see, uh, that gets closer to the response that I've had in understanding what kind of argument he's making. It, I have, I'm morally outraged at him um, <laughs> for that. And, and, and so, I mean, as and you say, as a historian, our t our method, our technique is go to the primary sources and understand what people said at the time and give credit to the, you know, the the complexity of the arguments that people had at the time. And I'm outraged by the way Zinn pretends as if these, one, pretends as if these things have never been discussed in the past, right? He, he pretends as if never in American history were there debates about for example, slavery, um, and you know, with with people obviously um, um, arguing very, very strongly against it, thus the Civil War, and that he, that it, it's not so much that he's making a moral argument that I'm worried about because I do think, in fact, as a, as a historian, I recognize that we're always making moral arguments. Uh, you know, we're telling mm -hmm. stories about human beings, and we're telling stories about you know, evaluating whether or not decisions made in the past were good decisions or bad decisions, or, you know, whether or not we see, um, I mean, if you're, do if you're doing an aesthetic history, right, like I am, I, 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 I'm concerned more with, you know, theology and aesthetics and devotion. I'm, I'm, I'm describing it in a way that I hope people find appealing, which you could say is, is highly rhetorical, right? right? I'm, I'm trying to make sure. my reader at least ha have the moment of saying, this practice is beautiful. So from my perspective of, as a historian, I'm not, I'm less upset with his, his moralizing in the, in the sense that I think all historians moralize. I'm more upset with his, his deception in pretending right. that none of these debates have been had in the past. Uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. I, it, 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 he, he's very egotistical. I, and it's, uh, you know, as a scholar, you always acknowledge what others have done, right? You're right. standing on the sh shoulders of giants. Uh, that's what, you know, conservatives are doing. Uh, radicals, uh, those on the left, uh, claim uh, to be discovering something new, destroying what was there before. I mean, I saw this in my English seminars, you know, when deconstruction was being promoted and and i saw it as an attempt to uh destroy what had come before you know it's sort of like you know in the 60s they said don't trust anyone over 30 and here it mm -hmm. was you had these you know graduate students who are pretending that they're smarter than <laughs> you know, all, all the other literary uh, scholars that had, uh, you know, lived before they did. They're seeing something new. They're picking things apart. And uh, wow, it's revelatory. And then the next one comes along and says, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> that person didn't really understand it. I understand it. Um, and that's not what scholarship is. It's not what honest uh, history uh, scholarship is. And I agree with you. Yes. Um, you know, history writing that doesn't have a point of view, uh, you know, by a writer who doesn't have sympathy for the subject, uh, the people 
is very dull. You don't want, you know, just a bunch of statistics um, and facts and, you know, which is what history textbooks have become. You know, they're written by committees. They don't want to offend anyone. And, and that's another reason why Zinn's book has had appeal because, you know, students who are just given, as, you know, as I remember, these dreadfully dull books to read that make, you know, reading history a chore, you know, read this. And it, he, he definitely does have a point of view. <laughs> right. So and that, that I think, so uh, that one of the things that we understand in, in, in the American history profession is uh, the product of uh, Peter Novick's book um, that uh-huh. came out in 1989, that, that um, that noble dream, the objectivity question in the American historical profession. And Peter was a member of my department when I first started here at Chicago. And I read his book then and said, this is, you know, he was already a superstar at that point. You know, he had American Historical Association sessions devoted to talking about his book. But the, the problem that he showed in his book was generationally, the American, you know, the, sh- the story of American history changes, right? And, and mm-hmm. to a certain extent, yeah. that is because you know, we, we see, we see more once, you know, 30 years on, you realize, oh my goodness, these things that were happening at the time have had these effects that we didn't appreciate they would have. We need to revise our understanding of the significance of that event. Um, Sympathy shift in the way in which the stories have been told. So, I mean, the examples that Peter used in his book were very closely focused on the civil war, which has been the great challenge for the American historical profession always, you know, how can you, if you're writing from a Southern perspective, acknowledge this, you know, the, 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 the ways in which the South was wrong, um, but Mm -hmm. also be able to show that, you know, the things that were destroyed of Southern culture may have been, some of them may have been worth keeping and vice versa with the North, right? That there, there, there are ways in which, of course, the abolition movement was, was um, generated out of Northern Christian concerns um and and in certain ways you know actively foisted on the south but on the other hand you know the the north has not always been innocent in its mm-hmm. attempts to rule over different regions of the country and that this this narrative it you can't tell there's no neutral american narrative was one of the things that peter was trying to show and what what he mm-hmm. he came up with by 1989 is we have no clue Right. As a nation. No, no. His his last chapter was there is no there was no king in Israel. Right. There was no by 1989 in the American historical profession itself. There was no sense of which narrative defined the nation's history. Hmm. Uh, yeah. I, I, it, you know, history is, uh, you know, from my understanding, coming to it as someone with a Ph.D. in English, uh, and the more I read about it, the, it's so complicated and people have their stories and it really is about story. And I like learning about history uh, by reading stories like biographies. Um, you know, I'm, I just finished the second volume of Robert Cairo's biography of Lyndon Johnson. Um, you know, I don't agree with him politically, but he is a masterful writer. And I don't think we'll ever resolve these things. I don't, and I think a lot of the critics of the way history was written before oversimplify it. Um, so, and and having lived, well, in yes, South, I agree, and I'll give you. Hello? Right, you were in Atlanta. You were in Atlanta. Yeah, right, right, and so I, you know, even as I was writing. Uh, th- my chapter on uh, slavery and Zinn's take on the Civil War, I was thinking, you know, I really had to uh, simplify it. Mm-hmm. And, and I focused on pointing out Zinn's, uh, you know, misrepresentations, historical misrepresentations. And, you know, naturally, I think that you know, freeing the slaves was a wonderful thing. But I also know many people in Georgia still, uh, you know, whose families, you know, are from the South. And I know that the representations of Southerners is grossly unfair. Uh, You know, only, I think it's like 6% of Southerners were slave owners. Uh, Many Southerners, uh, 
were sympathetic uh, to the abolitionist movement. Uh, so there's a wide variety and it's, it's not the way it's portrayed as, as you're saying, you know, this great dilemma about presenting the civil war and, and still the same divide that, you know, Southerners were all these backward bigots. I mean, that's not the case. It, it was very complicated. And even the idea of reconstruction was complicated. Uh, you know, there was fault from the North as well. And the other book I'm writing is about George Schuyler, uh, who was a uh, who was a libertarian, conservative black journalist who grew up in Syracuse, New York, near me. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, he wrote about uh, the North and uh, you know the discrimination he faced. You know, living in Harlem and also around the world. So. You can't really just categorize people. And I think that's what Howard Zinn does. He, he divides them into uh, those who are good and those who are evil. And those who are good are definitely on his side. Right, but his good, his good as a particular character, I mean, that he's, he's the champion of the oppressed and therefore he's the good guy. And yeah. there is, there is, I mean, what, so yes, what, I mean, what I find frustrating about it is there's a, a complete lack of complexity and it's all melodrama in, in the mm -hmm. way he's, he's, he's setting it out. But the, the, going back to one of the things you said about, you know, that we, I, I mean, I think it. I don't know whether I can use the term conservative anymore because I understand that, you know, the conservative, <laughs> the conservative movement politically has its own problems, but the, the, the sense of traditionalist in, in, in just recognizing the past as the thing that we depend on, the, what your, your phrase of the standing on the shoulders of giants. Most people think that comes from Newton, but of course it was Bernard of Chartres in the 12th century, um, quoted by John of Salisbury, himself lamenting the way in which those nouveau Aristotelians were coming in with their logic and destroying the the study of their liberal arts in the 12th century cathedral schools. It, it's a long problem. <laughs> and <laughs> and that I, as a medievalist, of course, am, I mean, I think one of the funny things that has happened to me in the sort of big sort of culture debate is I'm usually just sitting there going, I don't really agree with anybody on these <laughs> sides in, in the modern narrative because I know that the story is much longer than any mm -hmm. of these, from my perspective, fairly short-sighted um, narratives give credit to. For example, with just going back to Columbus, that the irony of it for me is that Zinn is in fact doing what Bartolome de las Casas did to the Spanish in the first place. And when mm -hmm. I, in um, my History of European Civilization section, we read de las Casas, um, a brief history of the Indies and compare it with various passages from Bernal Diaz's conquest of New Spain. And when we read Las Casas, he's, of course, writing to um, the emperor um, Charles V and his son, Philip II, saying, your majesties, don't you realize all of these atrocities that are being committed in your name? Um, you know, the, 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 the things like the dogs being set on the, the um, Americans and the lust for gold and the, the horrific massacres that the um, conquistadores were participating in. And, you know, Las Casas was writing at the time as a Dominican, as someone who had been participating in these land grants. He had had a grant of Indians himself for a while, um, slaves. And he he, he converted to um, the church and came out, you know, sort of swinging, saying, this is evil, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, Eng the, you know, the English who were themselves enemies of Spain at this point because they're Protestants and Spain is Catholic, translate Las Casas as, uh, you know, quick, quickly as they can, the Dutch do too, and say, this is what Spain's like, right? <laughs> and, and so you end up with, you know, and so when we read it in class and I say, you know, the students, do you agree with him? And they're all like, well, of course. And I'm like, well, of course you do. <laughs> One, he's right that these atrocities should not be taking place. But the problem is that he was he was himself engaged in the very kind of narrative that Zen is in, in the sense that he he's wiping out the whole situation that was actually taking place on the ground, which is what Diaz was concerned to show, right? He's like, Las Casas makes up all these stories, but in fact, I was there 
and this is how we ended up in the ambush. And this is why, you know, the Tlaxcalans were, in fact, you know, our allies against the Aztecs, whom they hated. You, you point to some of these things in your in your chapter um, on on the the way in which the the history of the the um, European settlers' contacts with the, the Native Americans is told that it's always told as if, well, these European settlers just sort of swoop in and, and massacre everyone. And it's it's much more complicated than that on the ground. Uh, yeah, a- absolutely. And Howardson ignores all that. Um, uh, you know, I, I looked at one of his sources, you know, for his famous chapter on uh, Columbus, and it's uh, Hans Koning, as you may remember, who basically made up stuff, <laughs> wrote, wrote this screed uh, that was used for in high school classes. And, and, you know, this is what Zinn claims his authority on, you know, um, Hans Koning, uh, you know, a, a novelist, a socialist, mm-hmm. a, mem- a member of Zinn's anti-Vietnam War group, uh, you know, with Noam Chomsky. So, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, these stories are very complicated. um, And Zinn is just writing communistic propaganda. It's uh, similar to uh, what William Z. Foster wrote. So I, I, I like to go to these old bookstores and I pick up these odd titles and uh, I don't know, years ago, I picked up William Z. Foster's uh, Outline Political History of the Americas. Mm-hmm. And and if you do a sort I mean, I could do a whole rhetorical study comparing that 1951 book to a people's history of the United States. And you see that the lines of argument are all the same. Um, you know, uh, North America in an Foster's case, uh, both the Americas are presented as these pristine, you know, virtual gardens of Eden, you know, feminist paradises <laughs> until right. the evil capitalist Europeans come in and kill everyone and steal and, uh, <laughs> you know, exploit women and so forth. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's not history. What you're talking about is history. You're teaching history. Zinn was not teaching history, and he did not write a history book. He wrote propaganda. Well, that he's not, I mean, what I tend to do in my classes at Chicago is teach only from primary sources, particularly for the undergraduates, that I want them to see what the people at the time said, right? But then... <laughs> I also get, I also have them practice. I mean, as, as you pointed out, you, you know, you use Aristotle in, in understanding rhetoric. The, the, the practice mm-hmm. of telling a story to get people on your side is as old as writing. And it's, it's, mm-hmm. and it's, it's, it's probably older, right? It's, 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 the it's whole, rhetoric. Yes. <laughs> it's rhetoric, right? Mm-hmm. And, and the, the naivete of, you know, Zen pretending that nobody, that he discovered rhetoric, in fact. <laughs> Right. <laughs> only only I have been able to make the persuasive carrying argument for, you know, the, the, the defendants here and and to not even acknowledge that. I mean, the, the other irony that I have is on the one hand, he's ultimately depending on the, the black legend that that Las Casas inadvertently created for Spain because mm-hmm. Spain's enemies picked it up and, and used it against them. Uh, but he's also and this, I think, you know, must have con- con- created some. Well, I don't know whether he was this self-conscious, right? It should have created some problems for him as a communist, although you also talk about how he he managed to skirt round ever actually acknowledging that he was a communist. It should have created a problem for him from a communist perspective of, in fact, using Christian theological arguments, because <laughs> that is, it, that Las Casas argument is you cannot convert people to Christianity with violence, right? And and Las Casas is also directly responsible for the image of the Indians that that you say Zen, you know, picks up from Koning and, and intensifies that they're innocent and they're simple and they're, you know, childlike. Uh, of course, what Diaz says is they were great warriors and you know mm-hmm. they they fought valiantly against us. And and Las Casas creates this image of the, you know they were helpless in the face of of you know what it was initially a relatively small number of of Spaniards, but he also, as as you pointed out, miss 
misrepresents even what Columbus himself says so that we we don't end up hearing things about how um this this is from the journal right from the log right and and you you point out that Zen doesn't quote this full passage it it's fairly long and in fact he quotes like oh you know they'll they'll be good servants right but what he's actually been arguing is they were friendly we we exchanged gifts they're beautiful um you know he talks about how they paint themselves with colors Weapons they have none nor acquainted with them, for I showed them swords which which they grasped by the blades and cut themselves through ignorance. And that is, of course, technologically true that the the, um, the Americans didn't have metal weapons; they used stone. They have no iron; their javelins being without it, and nothing more than sticks. Though some have fish bones and other things at the ends. They are all in stature and hand armed. I saw some with scars of wounds upon their body and demanded by signs of them. Uh, there's a mistype in this translation I'm reading. They answered me in the same way that there came people from the other islands in the neighborhood who endeavored to make prisoners of them when they defended themselves. I thought then and still believe that these were from the continent. It appears to me that the people are ingenious and would be good servants. And I'm of the opinion they would be re very readily become Christians as they appear to have no religion. That's not uh -huh. true, but, you know, um, they very quickly learn such words as are spoken to them. If it please our Lord, I intend at my return to carry home six of these to your highnesses. That's for Nan and Isabella, right? That they may learn our language. I saw no beasts in the island or any sort of animals except parrots. Um, and there are all sorts of things that, you know, Zen does not want to acknowledge that, that, uh -huh. that Columbus sees them as intelligent, as beautiful. And I think with the good servants, I I I want to follow that up on proper, with proper translations, but he could mean subjects of the crown, right? That, that they will be, and servant is a fairly complicated term in 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 Christian thinking, and it either is they'll be good servants of God or they'll be good servants of the crown, but it doesn't necessarily mean slaves. And he wants to bring them and um, have them educated. Now it is it is true that things didn't develop well for Columbus. He was he was mm -hmm. a good rouser of of you know well. He managed to get those three ships to start with, but he had some troubles with his crew on a number of occasions. So he, he wasn't necessarily the best of admirals. On the other hand, he is, as and from my own understanding, a good witness of the complexity of the European response to these peoples, that they expected them to be human. They expected them to be rational. They expected them to be able to, to um, be taught. And that's what Las Casas was actually arguing, that we should take care to treat them well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which, I mean... Which Zen doesn't want anybody to hear, clearly. Right, yeah. So he so he leaves out, you know, that, that critical information. Um, you know, he casts history into these Manichaean terms. Right. Where, where all the uh, European uh, capitalists are evil and all the, you know, sort of primitive people the indians are good and um and he can't acknowledge um you know that columbus's intentions were good uh you know he, you know zid may not like the idea of trying to convert convert them to christianity right uh, <laughs> but but his intentions were good and he wanted to spread the Christian message. Now, the very same people like Zinn and other historians, uh, you know, I came across, uh, you know, histories of, you know, the, the North American tribes. And, you know, a lot of these historians will uh, look at, uh, say, cannibalism by the North American Indians and try to frame it as, you know, part of their religious beliefs, you know, they thought that if they uh, ate the heart of, a, uh, you know, of, a, of an enemy, that they would gain their bravery and strength. Uh, but this was part of their religious uh, belief. Well, that's okay for the Indians. But <laughs> right, uh, you know, heaven forbid that uh, a European should try to convert the Indians to Christianity, <laughs> which doesn't believe in that. <laughs> yes, and and that to me uh, is 
it's screaming what the tension is throughout all of this historiography that um, a Christian perspective, I mean, never mind a European perspective, but specifically a Christian perspective is always, you know, either um, hypocritical or, or, yeah. you know, murderous or and but then when Diaz is saying you know the reason that these Tlaxcalans were willing to ally with us is because the Aztecs were you know demanding of them a uh, tribute of people to you know ex you know to to um sacrifice and uh -huh. and therefore they hated the Aztecs and that's why the you know Cortez was able to to get the allies that he did none of that right. seems to feature in these tellings of you know the reason the reason that the, the Spaniards were able to to conquer the Aztecs as they were is because the Aztecs were so hated by the people they had conquered. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, Howard Zinn puts it uh, that the um, that the Europeans set them against each other, these different tribes, <laughs> that they instigated the conflicts when the conflicts have been going on for over 100 years. So, you know, they were enemies. Uh, so, it, it's just outright lies. Um, well, and, and, it's, and it's lies about human nature. It's this this fantasy that somehow the Europeans are uniquely sinful and all other people are uniquely sinless. That's right. And and the way uh, Michael Kazin, one of Zinn's left wing critics uh, before the affair at Purdue University, uh likened his Michael Kazin, of course, a former member of the SDS, uh, a one time member of the Weather Underground, mm. uh, left his leftist historian, um, slammed people's history. He said that Zinn's theory was more suitable to a conspiracy monger's website than an actual work of history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. And if you if you if you really look, you know, take a close look at or deconstruct Howard Zinn's history, he sets it up so that, you know, Columbus becomes the original, the progenitor of all these other uh, Western imperialists. And so it's just a long line of um you know westerners uh who commit these atrocities all for capitalist gain and so there is this big conspiracy and he also uses words like the system capitalized and mm -hmm. the establishment right words that aren't <laughs> you know who uses the establishment anymore but sin gets away with it Right. Uh, so there, so there's this huge force. There's this big conspiracy out there, and yeah, we we just you know need to have a revolution and knock it down, and knock it, and more deconstruction. Yeah. So yeah. I'm I'm curious. I'm curious how how do we counter this kind of moralizing tale, right? And I'd say, I mean, your approach in 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 your book has been show show Zinn's deceptions in terms of his use of other scholarship, his use of the sources, his own self-representation. How effective has that been? Uh, I, you've told me that you've been talking to a, quite a lot of people giving lectures and, and presentations. How effective has the method that you've chosen been to, to help sort of, in fact, puncture the, puncture the um, myth-making? Well, are, I, uh, are people receptive? <laughs> Does it work? Um, Please give us yeah, hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm hearing from parents uh, who had their children subject to Howard Zinn in high school, maybe college. Uh, one guy uh, bought five copies for family members after he started reading the book. Uh, people have been frustrated because they know there's something horribly wrong with Howard Zinn's book. And they may flip through it and say, this is nonsense. You know, they see one of his lies and say, this is nonsense. And a lot of people have written articles about it. But here is one place where you can go and say, okay, let's look at this source. 
uh, they can look at my footnotes and go back to the original source and see right. where ellipses leave out essential information that, you know, give the opposite uh, idea. So I want, but I also want to reach young people uh, um, and, you know, spread the word about it. Give this as a form of ammunition to, well, uh, conservatives or mm -hmm. even honest liberals who have been frustrated by Zinn's popularity. Uh, you know, there was a state uh, legislator in Arkansas a couple years ago who, tr who wanted to take Zinn out of public schools, a perfectly uh, reasonable thing to want to do. I mean, Zinn's book is as fraudulent as David Irving's uh, Holocaust denying histories of Germany. Um, and, and if, you know, Hitler, we wouldn't use that in the classroom. Why would we use Howard Zinn? We don't use books that uh, sugarcoat slavery uh, and say, uh, you know, uh, and promote the myth that all slaves were just happy and jolly living on plantations. Why would we promote Howard Zinn? And one of the things I'm noticing is I, I thought, you know, the book's been out for a little over a month now. I thought I'd be getting pushback from the leftists. I haven't seen anything at the Zen Education Project, the Nation Magazine, the Progressive, any of those places that is refuting what I'm saying. Well, um, my guess, my that's interesting. My guess is they know that if they they draw attention to your book, that's worse for them. So, I mean, you know, it's like if they ignore it, then they can just pretend that it's not out there. And wow. if, if, they, if they highlight it, people are going to go read it and find out what you've shown is, is Zinn's a con man. Right. And they're not trying to show me as being a con woman. <laughs> right. So I, I, the problem, and I, I, this I, this would be my last question, but it, I, I realize it could open a whole other can of worms. The problem is, and this is where why I originally designed back, in fact, in the early 90s, this course I do on medieval travel that ends up with Columbus, is that at that point, well, one, there was this problem of imagining that medieval Europeans never traveled anywhere. And of course, that's not true, particularly in the 13th century when the Mongols have you talk about people are talking about worrying about white supremacy. They should really have been worried about Mongol supremacy. <laughs> <laughs> there that I've been been quite fascinated by the who H W H U right who are singing songs about their great ancestors and why you know what happened to our people. Um, that the Mongols when they conquered the sweep of Eurasia, in effect opened up Europe to China for a, a good several generations and it's in that period when Marco Polo makes his journey to to the east and um, we have stories like um, William of Rubrook's efforts to convert the Mongols we have John Mandeville's famous travel narrative you know looking for paradise and it was those sorts of sources that Columbus was actually reading and what what I was working with was the the the, the claim that you know Columbus was this great um, scientific traveler who had stood up to the bigoted theologians at Salamanca who didn't believe, you know, that the world was round and didn't mm -hmm. believe that they were on the other world and such. And, and it's like, one, everybody in the Middle Ages who was at all educated and, for example, could read Dante knew that the world was round. And two, we know from throughout the Middle Ages that Europeans expected to find, as Columbus describes, you know, human beings to whom you could speak and potentially bring the word of God. And the narrative that I was countering was invented by Washington Irving, another great American storyteller <laughs> in the early 19th century. And he creates this sort of fantasy version of Columbus before the doctors of Salamanca. And here Columbus is the only one with scientific knowledge and the rest of them are benighted Catholic bigots. <laughs> So the benighted Catholic bigots stick around, but the, the the sort of hero has changed. Now it's no longer Columbus the scientist. It's Howard Zinn, the um, <laughs> critic of all European knowledge in the first place. And I, so, I, you know, I'm, 
these mythologies are very, very hard to to counter. And I'm 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 wondering now that now that you've written your your proof of his lying, what do you what do you think the next best move is in terms of our storytelling? Uh, well, I, I think what we need to do is uh, we need to focus on the complexities. If you're talking about history, uh, one of my big uh, complaints about education is that literature is not being taught anymore uh, under Common Core. Uh, you only have snippets, carefully selected snippets mm. from works of fiction or speeches. And, uh, you know, especially from like Frederick Douglass, I, I use, I think they take their cue from Howard Zinn, his, um, you know, Frederick Douglass's 1852 speech. They leave out the part where he calls the Constitution a glorious liberty document. Um, but also getting back to like reading all of Frederick Douglass's autobiography, mm -hmm. uh, re reading biographies, autobiographies, uh, novels, uh, I just uh, finished Willa Cather's One of Ours. I mean, I think you can learn this part of history uh, from novels that uh you can't even get from a lot of histories. I mean, Robert Cairo is a wonderful storyteller. He's so detailed. But in order to sort of get the essence of what it was like to live in that time period or to imagine a, a soldier, an American soldier from the American Midwest dying uh, in, uh, you know, in France, um, and what it was like for his mother. You can read Willa Cather. Um, you, and you also, I think, by reading fiction, you develop the sense of empathy and an understanding of human complexity. And that complements the study of history because history is incredibly complex. I, you know, the more I read about, read history, the more I, um, I think, have an appreciation for the difficulties that uh, people who came before us faced. Uh, it, it, you know, it's not a, a simple morality tale of good guys versus bad guys, you know, as Howard Zinn likes to say. So I think this, uh, this way of educating students, uh, taking them away from uh, reading on their own long works, uh, primary sources as you do, but I think those need direction and they need oh, to yes. be read and oh, right. You can't just what you no, know. What am that's, I? That's that's my whole exercise is is teaching them how to to understand what kinds of problems different sorts of sources create. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I. I I know that there's a, a trend now to sort of take students up into the archives and let them loose and they read a letter from, uh, you know, say Flannery O'Connor and conclude, oh, she was a bigot. <laughs> right. right. I hate that. But, but uh, you know, what they're doing now with students, it's social and emotional learning, it's group activities, it's discussions, it's, uh, it's really just brainwashing. And so I think we need to get back to doing a lot of reading, uh, writing. And I'm hoping, you know, that my book on Howard Zinn, uh, you know, kind of exposes how, uh, you know, someone who is a polemicist subverts that. Howard Zinn is really an insult to scholarship. He himself. Uh, really did not teach. He did not write any legitimate history after his dissertation. He was a fraud. He was a huckster. He, uh, you know, he was a, a communist activist. And I also, in my book, I hope I bring to light 
some parts of American history that have been hidden. I think there's a great story or stories to be told about the civil rights movement uh, and about immigration, uh, you know, the earlier immigrants. So I'm hoping that, you know, this will get people uh, to start thinking and rather than being completely utilitarian and saying, well, we just need to teach these skills to students and teach them how to get along, we'll return to the classical idea of learning. Amen. Well, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm so thankful for you taking the time to talk through your work and sort of brainstorm about how we do better. Um, and I very much hope you continue to get many, many invitations to talk about this book because it's a, a very important wake up call. I think for many of us, myself, not really appreciating the, the effect that Zen had been having directly, not just indirectly, but directly on what was being taught in the classroom. It's, you've helped me um, understand some of the things that I hear my own students say. And I'm very, very grateful to you for doing this, this important work. So um, thank you so much for joining me and um, I hope to talk again soon. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Bye. Bye.